Good morning. Welcome to BST Live, the show for systematic and algorithmic traders. Glad you could join us today, where we're going to be talking about market noise and how we can use market noise to improve our trading strategies. And our special guest today, I'm very excited to uh, introduce him because I've been in touch with him for many, many years now. We've had a lot of emails going back and forth, so it's great to have you on the show today. Welcome, Martin Tinsley from Trade Like a Machine. Welcome, Martin. Hi, Andrew. How are you? It's great to be on your show finally. Yeah, it's great to uh, have you here finally, actually. As I mentioned, we've been going back and forth for, uh, I don't know, since the beginning, very beginning of BST, Better System Trader. So, Absolutely. Yeah, how- yeah I, I was right there at the beginning. Yeah. So now it's uh, great that you, uh, you've you been able to join our fantastic list of guests that we've had on the show uh, so far. So um, before we get into market noise, I know you've got a lot of great stuff to share with us today. But before we get into that, how about we um, we talk about your background or can you share with us a little bit of your background and how you got started in trading? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I've I've always been fascinated by using mathematical predictive models. And um, even back at the age of sort of maybe 12, 13, I was developing computer programs to predict the outcomes of football matches, for example. So sort of taking in data about what the home record was of a team and the away record and sort of matching that up with the opposing team and trying to make a prediction about the result of the of the of the football match and interestingly you know even even back then i came to this realization that has served me really well ever since especially in my algo trading which was that it's not about getting the result right it's about predicting what the probabilities of different outcomes are. And if you know what those probabilities are, then that serves you well in terms then of acting on that information. Mm-hmm. And um, so sort of from, from then, you know, I always had an interest in, in coding. From then I went in terms of ac- academic sort of background, I went to university, studied physics and astrophysics, both very much um based on on maths obviously and then in my first job i sort of continued with that and and my my first job really helped me actually in my journey to become an algo trader because i was working in a research department within a university and my responsibility was to develop applications that took in live data streams for things like you know ecgs from from cardiac um mm. assessments and uh, eegs from brain brain waves and and the same from muscle activity and to combine all of that information together real time process it and then have some feedback loop to the patient and So that taught me a whole skill set in terms of how to efficiently, you know, take live data and process and come out with some kind of outcome. Mm. So so that served me really well, I guess. And then I suppose my career path then took a little bit of a different turn. And it wasn't until probably about 10 years ago that I eventually started to turn my skills to algo trading. And I think like like most traders, when they start to, you know, on the journey of of, of something like this, it, it, it's difficult at first. And, you know, it took maybe a year or two to become profitable. Um, but then as I did start to become profitable, you know, over the next sort of eight years or so, I've started to build up a trading track record. And then more recently, um, now started to get some investor capital via the, the Darwin X platform in my, my own trading strategies. And, and also um, Darwin X approached me about 18 months ago and asked me to start producing um, educational material for other algo traders which is what what i do as well so that's my sort of that's the potted history i guess of my journey to becoming an algo trader yeah so i think uh, today 
with uh, some of the noise uh, research and insight, insights you're going to share, we're going to see how that, um, you know, talking about the mapping of probabilities and things, how that, um, you know, feeds into what you're doing now. But um, so as far as you're trading now, can you give us a bit of an insight into the markets, the styles, the timeframes that you uh, prefer to trade in? Yeah, sure. So it's it's fully automated algorithmic mm. trading that, that I do. And really, I trade a range of, of strategies. So really anything that I think I can exploit in the in the financial markets, I, I, I'm happy to, to give a go. Um, and so range of strategies, range of time frames. Um, typically, the trades across my strategies might last anything from 10 minutes up to a few days. And in terms of the assets that I, I trade, predominantly currency pairs, but also a couple of stock indices, um, a couple of commodities as well. Yeah, okay. Well, how about um, to start with, we, we dig a little bit more into your, uh, I guess, your general approach to strategy development. You, you've given us some, some um, uh, insights into how you, I guess, how you've come up to this point and how that might have... Um, you know, fed into what you're doing now. But can you just give us a bit more information into the types of things you look at when you're building your strategies? Sure. So so typically, I, I always start off with the raw price action, you know, and, and sort of focusing on investigations around that price action looking for repeatable patterns um, and obviously when you find these things it's then a case of sort of determining how can I exploit this pattern to to my advantage and I guess early on in my uh, career as an algo trader one, one of the mistakes that I I made and I think I see a lot of other traders making this as well is that, that there's a there's too much of a focus on indicators early on in the strategy development process and and that's quite damaging I think and sort of inhibits the ability to get a really profitable system and so, so for me, it, the whole focus is around those repeatable patterns that can be exploited. And then only once you've got that really nailed in terms of what you need to achieve, should you then start to look at things like indicators. OK, there are other ways as well, but look at indicators to, to effectively tell you when that price pattern is happening in the market right now and that for me is the correct way to use indicators mm -hmm. and you know early on in my career certainly i fell into the the, the the trap really of of trying to combine different indicators together to get some back test to work and you know, I really think it's it's incredibly difficult to get a profitable, um, robust strategy by taking that approach. But if you come at it from that subtly different angle mm. and you, you, you sort of use it to tell you when different price patterns are happening, then it, it's a much sort of better a, approach to take. And it was interesting, actually, because... Um, I I actually have peer sessions with a guy now. Even though I've, I've known him for quite a while, I still struggle with his surname. He's a guy called Stefan Friedrichowski, and I know he's been on your your show before. Yeah, and and I have peer sessions, and and I spoke with him last week, and we actually decided that we'd do a joint development of a trading strategy, and we talked about what we might try to try to achieve and what we would be targeting and what the edge would be and, and Stefan said to me he said look you know I need to go away now and just study price charts and at that point I knew it was going to be good because because that's exactly the approach I take you know it's that process of going through studying price charts and sometimes you know it takes a few hours to to come to some kind of a decision about what you're going to do sometimes it's it's longer than that 
And so um, I'll be getting back together with Stefan at some point to sort of get our heads together and, and work out where we go. But both of us said, you know, we needed that space and that time to just study the charts to to, to work out how we were going to go about it. Mm, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned repeatable patterns in there. Um uh, have you um, have you found any particular uh, factors or patterns that really drive a lot of your um, your work? Like, uh, are some more important than others? So you know, it's the it's the real sort of most basic of patterns that I tend to try to exploit, and so it's the you know the it's the things that everyone talks about it, it's it's that it's that ability of price action to mean revert okay so when it becomes overbought or oversold it has this just this natural tendency to return to the mean okay and then of course when it's in a completely different mode in momentum mode you know it, it, it sort of almost ignores that mean reverting um phase that it was in previously enters this new kind of mode and goes into the in, into the momentum phase and so it's really you know just those very core fundamental patterns in the price action that i'm attempting to target and i think one of the advantages of doing that rather than looking for much more specific patterns is that you know these things happen in the markets all of the time if you're looking for something very specific that doesn't happen very often it means that you're going to really struggle to um to back test and optimize that in a statistically significant way because you just simply won't have many trades but by tackling those those things that just continually happen it means you can get you know tens of thousands of trades in your back tests which means the results you're getting are much more statistically significant and you can believe the results and have trust in the system when you eventually put it live. So, so, the, so it's, the, it's the core patterns that I tend to target. Yeah, okay. We've got some more questions about the patterns in the chat, which I think we'll, we'll come back to a little bit later on, um, just sure. so that we can get to the main topic, which is obviously market noise. Um, now, that's uh, uh, I know from our previous discussions, it's quite an important aspect of your trading and your strategy development. Mm -hmm. Can you explain um, how, did that, how did that come to be? How did you discover that market noise was um, an important factor to consider in, in trading and strategy development? Well, well, this is this is funny actually because it was it was watching your show that initially <laughs> many years ago sort of made me start to start to investigate it and and it was it was one of your very first episodes when you had Perry Kaufman on. I mm. think it was Perry's first um, sort of. I know he's been on a few times, hasn't he? But yeah. This is yes. his first first episode, right? And he, he talked about this thing called the efficiency ratio that he developed himself. And I, I went away and I, I've always been a big fan of, of Perry. And um, I, I think it might have been that that I can't remember if I already had his his trading systems and methods book at the time or not. I, I can't quite remember, but I certainly bought it if I didn't. And, and I sort of went into the efficiency ratio in a lot more detail. And I found that that could really improve um, the effectiveness of a number of different trading strategies that I was investigating at the time. And just by using that, that as, a, as a filter effectively, you know, gave significant improvements. Now, at the time, that was... I still use it today. But it's only much more recently that I started to really dig into noise in, in, a, in a big way and do my own research around it, probably the last 12 months. And what I've, what I've realized is that, you know, when you get that fundamental understanding of what noise is, why it occurs, and also the implications it has for all of us, as traders 
you can actually do a lot more with it to turn noise to your advantage in some mm. cases but also in other cases to remove the detrimental effects of noise yeah okay so so um yeah it's it, it's one of those things that i the more i look at it the more i realize how important it is yep okay well well let's start with some of those fundamentals then um just to make sure that we're all you know we've got a good understanding of what we're talking about here so can you uh, uh explain a little bit about what market noise is and why it occurs yeah sure okay so you you've probably heard the phrase two steps forward one step back okay and noise is a little bit like that so price action does not travel in straight lines if you're looking at a chart in real time you'll see the price go up and then it'll go down and then it'll go up again and they'll, uh, it'll go down okay and those upwards and downwards movements of in the price action really are irrespective of what the meaningful price action is doing and by meaningful price action you know these are the price moves that we're actually looking to exploit with our trading strategies but all of these fluctuations that occur during those meaningful moves both up and down are what i understand as being noise so most traders i think would probably see noise as a nuisance okay it's something that just gets in the way of the trading strategy that you've developed which is targeting those more meaningful price moves the longer term price moves as opposed to the really really short term fluctuations which are, are known as as market noise and i think you sort of said you know what 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 causes it yeah well it's 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 a combination of things and th there was another guest of yours actually called <laughs> linda rashke i think uh, and she came up with this what i thought was a marvelous phrase it was it was the the smorgasbord of activity that takes place in the financial markets and when she explained that it was the fact that you know there are so many participants in the market doing different you know trying to execute different strategies they're working in different time frames you have some speculative traders you've got other long-term investments that are being made in, in in different underlying assets and and all of this activity is happening concurrently at the same time mm. so you're always in this situation where some people are thinking the time's right to buy others are thinking the time is right to sell and those that buying and selling activity is what creates those short-term fluctuations okay but behind all of this and if you like at a higher level you've got those more meaningful moves which represent what the consensus is from all of those participants mm. so if the consensus is long then the price will go up if the consensus is short it will go down but regardless of that you've still got all this buying and selling activity which gives you that short term fluctuation which is the noise and that that's mm. my understanding of of what causes noise in the markets yeah yeah so what then what's what's the implication to traders and trading strategies with these uh you know these f fluctuations in the markets so yeah so so i i guess you know as i've said i think most most traders view noise as being problematic and it just just gets in the way of their strategy executing the way they wanted it to 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 execute in many cases that's absolutely you know absolutely true and when you talk about you know tr momentum based strategies so trend following strategies noise tends to cause some major issues 
for those strategies mainly in the fact that it causes you to get whipsawed out of the market so when you when you enter you know you might try to enter into a trend early on in that trend using you know a variety of techniques but let, let's just you know keep it simple and look at something like a moving average crossover and and the fact that noise exists will cause that crossover to happen possibly three or four times before the trend then takes the the price away um and all of those crossovers can potentially cause whipsaws and obviously that's problematic because if you have three or four of those each one of those is incurring costs is losing money and and, and that can have a a really detrimental impact on the you know the overall performance of your strategy mm -hmm. but there's another side to the coin and often with different types of strategies so for example mean reversion strategies noise can actually work in your favor okay if you know how to handle noise it can actually help you to get out of your trade profitably whereas if noise didn't exist you you would maybe struggle with that and and so i'll, I'll talk about that in a sort of a bit more detail later on mm. but noise isn't always the big evil um, sometimes you can definitely turn it to your advantage but but the fact is whether whether you're trying to reduce the detrimental effects or whether you're trying to use it to your advantage it's really important either way to understand how it works and to understand how to handle it Mm, yeah yeah okay well thanks for that explanation martin i think we've uh, covered the fundamentals of noise so how about we move on to the more practical aspects now um so how do you incorporate noise into your strategy development process do you do you look it up look at it up front or do you use it as a filter later on or how do you how do you go about actually applying that okay so so i i guess th there's there's a couple of techniques that i would would use mm. which are, are quite different really in in the in the overall outcome but but the first one would be around um, asset and time frame filtering based on intelligence that you you get from research around different assets and how different assets are affected by noise so um it might be useful, actually, Andrew, if I can share my screen. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Yep. So, so what what I've got here is a a ranked list of of different assets. I think there's just over forty assets here, um, in terms of their average noise okay and 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 what i i'm using the efficiency ratio to measure that noise now the efficiency ratio is is the calculation behind it means that the higher the value the more efficient the price action is okay and so it's like the inverse of noise so if the efficiency ratio is high so that's the biggest bars here on the right hand side that means these have low levels of noise whereas all of the assets on the left have um, have higher levels of noise because they're less efficient in their price action so on the um let me just see if i can get my these are penny so on the left hand side here we've got um aussie dollar kiwi dollar okay so from the analysis that I undertook here, which was over, I think, I looked at the most recent four months of, of price activity for all of these assets. Um, and you can't really use much longer than that because noise changes over time anyway. So, so this is the, the most recent four months. And Australian dollar, Kiwi dollar came out as the most noisy of all of these assets and then over on the uh, the right hand side here gosh i can't even see this on my screen let me just make this a bit bigger um australian dollar us dollar interestingly came out as the least 
noisy okay mm. as measured by the by the efficiency ratio now in terms of the color coding here the blue bars are all currency pairs the green are stock indices and the red uh, are metals so gold silver and a couple of energies and so the the principle here is that when you're using let's say asset filtering is that you will only trade the assets that are preferable for the noise that your strategy requires so as an example okay trend following strategies don't like noise and so the symbols that are over on the right hand side here are probably going to be a lot more suited to trend following strategies and you're likely to have a lot more success with them okay however the symbols that are on the left hand side these are the more noisy symbols and so you'll tend to find that these are a lot more effective for mean reversion type strategies so that's what I mean by asset filtering. It's effectively mm. going through that process of determining which assets are likely to give you the biggest success. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Now, the, the efficiency ratio is just one way of, of measuring um, noise. There, there are others. And another one that I've you know put quite a bit of effort into recently in terms of my research and development is something called the price density okay now with price density this doesn't measure efficiency this measures noise directly and so that's why these two charts are the opposite way around you know one one's going up and one's coming down but these are still ranked in the same order and so on the right hand side of both of these charts these are the least noisy and then on the left hand side these are the most noisy it's just the, the underlying calculation behind them means you have to interpret them in in a different way mm. but just to sort of illustrate i guess the way that the noise can impact the successfulness of, of your strategies I've, I've got a couple of slides of of, a, of a, a very simple mean reversion strategy that um i've been working on on recently right. and this is a long short strategy so that's why i've concentrated here on on the currency pairs because i want to be able to trade those long short in a symmetric way which obviously you can't do with with stock indices and so on so so i focused mostly on on currency pairs in in my research here and this is the this is the result of that mean reversion strategy when trading all 28 pairs concurrently okay so this is this is um, like an average of all all of the all of the currency pairs mm -hmm. and just just to explain the chart pretty pretty simple but the the blue line is obviously the the equity curve the orange line here is the the high water mark and then the gray line is is the risk tolerance so so the risk tolerance here is set at 10% so in other words if you you're in a 10% drawdown then the price will sorry the equity will come down and touch that that line so clearly it's violating that that 10% um, level which which you know is 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 problematic probably down to about 40 percent drawdown in some cases here but remember this is when trading all of those all of mm. those current pairs together but let me show you what happens if you now take just the eight um currency pairs that are the most noisy mm. and you take the eight currency pairs that are the least noisy okay and what you get is this okay and this is wow you know this is just a, a really sort of clear example i think of of the effect of noise so on the left hand side here we've taken the eight most noisy currency pairs 
and without changing anything else about that strategy, this is now what we see in the equity curve. So, so here we've, we've reduced drawdowns firstly to about 5%. And we've also, you know, we've also increased the return on, on that strategy. But take a look at the right hand side here. These are the least noisy um, pairs and it's worse than break even. OK, so, so that's that's just a, an illustration of, of the kind of impact you can get. Not by, you know, mo most traders. And it's probably a good opportunity for me to say this. I would say that if most traders put a, um, a strategy together and they got a result like this, the temptation is to, you know, start to optimize that mm. and to look at all of the different parameters that you can you can optimize across the indicators you're using and so on to try and get better performance out of it. And, and the risk with optimization always is that you will overfit. Okay. Now I'm not saying optimization is a bad thing, far from mm. it, but you have to be so careful when you optimize that you don't overfit. Now, by taking an approach like this, where you're effectively filtering based on research you've done before you even started to put the strategy together, means that for me, you know, that that's giving you those improvements without very much risk that you're doing anything that's going to overfit that strategy. And so mm. if you can get to this kind of point that you can see on the left here, before you even start to optimize the strategy, then, you know, you've, you've made some great sort of headway and you don't now have the temptation that you're going to start to try to optimize four, five, six, seven parameters to get decent results. You can now do a really sensible, pragmatic optimization using maybe just the, the two most important parameters to your strategy in order to just, just hone and to tweak that strategy and make it a little bit more effective. Mm, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, sorry, I'll, I'll, I oh. think I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a really um, good example here. I'm um, um, I'm glad that you uh, showed this in a visual format because it's very clear uh, exactly the impact of noise on these strategies. One of the one of the comments you made when we were talking about um, let me just switch the chart off so we can see each other. One of the comments you made when we, when you we were talking about the asset uh, filtering or ranking based on noise, you said um, you know that it it can change over time. So if mm. you're building strategies that are targeted, say, for example, the Aussie New Zealand uh, currency pair, and that decides to go on a trend for six months, how do you manage that? Because it's no longer um, showing the, the noise characteristics that you built the strategy for or that you're expecting. So what do you do when, um, you know, the market conditions change? So so there's, there's, a, there's a couple of couple of things you can do. But, but first, I would say... I think you know one of the things you said there, Andrew. You said you know when when the market starts trending, okay. Just because the market starts trending doesn't mean that noise has necessarily reduced. Okay, mm. you can still get those short-term fluctuations, and you do still get those short-term fluctuations even during trends. Okay, and that's one of the things that causes trend followers to to have you know such a rough time with with noise. Right. So the, the two things are, are sort of subtly different. And, and really the, the thing that in my view that changes noise over time, it comes back to this, this concept of market participation. And the more participation you have in a particular asset, typically the noisier it will be. And so if you measure noise over, let's say, a 10 year, 20 year, whatever period, the usual change in noise is that it increases. So over, mm. uh, and the reason for that is that, you know, trading over the years has become much more accessible. And because it's become much more accessible, more and more participants 
are starting to you know be a part of, of of that of that trading and so because of that those really short term fluctuations caused by the instantaneous buying and selling effectively increase the noise mm. and so if you think about it the effect that this has is that over time it makes trend following systems actually more and more difficult to to get an edge from because of mm. that increased noise activity however the converse of that is that from a mean reversion perspective it actually makes it easier and i think this is this is possibly you know one of the reasons why i think that, that there's a there's a there's a move from those trend following to more mean reversion because it's becoming i think easier to get um to exploit an edge in mean reversion type strategies now because of that increased noise yeah. but, but but another way that you can you know to directly answer your question so what i've talked about here is one technique which is asset filtering but you can also do that on a time frame basis because noise noise changes across time frames as well so so, so that's sort of one category of uh tactic that you can take but another is what i term instantaneous noise filtering and this is not where you say well i'm only going to trade you know the the eight most noisy assets here you you would trade a much wider range of of assets but at the time that you were getting your signals to open a trade you'd look at what the instantaneous noise is because when we looked at the chart earlier on which was the sort of the ranking of all of those assets um that's an average okay but even aussie kiwi dollar still fluctuates itself and sometimes it will exhibit low noise and sometimes it will exhibit high levels of noise and so you could still trade that even with a trend following system as long as you looked at what the noise was at that time and if it was suitable to the strategy and the, the noise was low enough for a trend following strategy you would still be able to trade it so it's, there's those two different techniques i think you can take one something that you do prior even to developing the system where you categorize the the assets in terms of noise and make a decision up front about what you're going to trade and the other is where you do it real time in the markets as part of your assessment of the the trade open hmm. yeah okay we've got quite a few questions in the chat which i want to get to in a in a moment but i just want to ask you uh, a statement you just said there um noise noise changes across time frames can you uh, clarify exactly what you mean by that? Yeah, sure. Can I um, can I share my screen again? Sure. Please? I'll just switch it on for you. There we go. Okay. So 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 this is this is an assessment here of all forty two of those assets that we looked at a moment ago, but all all the assets together but now looking at them from a different angle looking at them from the angle of, of time frames okay now remember this is the efficiency ratio again and so mm. the lower the bar the higher the noise okay so you can see that the the most noisy time frame here as part of this analysis was the one minute time frame the one minute chart and then as you sort of go through those time frames through five minute 15 up to the hour you'll notice that the you know that the noise decreases as you go up that time frame and that pretty much fits with what the standard understanding of noise is and generally speaking most people think you know lower time frames high noise higher time frames, low noise. However, what my research has shown is that yes, that's the case up until a point, typically the H1 time frame, but after that, 
noise for whatever reason and i have to say i don't understand why this is but these are the results i've obtained mm -hmm. noise starts to increase again as you go up into those higher time frames like the four hour or the daily charts and you know i've i've tried to work out why this happens and i haven't yet found an answer maybe some of your audience today might want to put forward some suggestions <laughs> as to why that is mm. but but this this is this is uh, so this was a surprise to me but but it's um, it's something that i think you can again turn to your advantage because what it means is that typically if you follow that model of trend following systems not benefiting from noise but mean reversion benefiting from it what it means is that as you go down to the lower time frames you're more likely to be effective with mean reversion strategies and for those time frames that have higher noise uh, sorry lower noise you're um you're, you're they're going to be more suited to maybe trend following strategies and so that's the sort of the, the time frame filtering that i was talking about Mm. Yeah, and then what about um, you know the forex markets or currency pairs are a twenty-four hour market? I imagine there's periods of time during during the day or sessions where noise is probably different to other parts. What have you found about, or have you even done that kind of research into sessions and which ones are noisier compared to others? Do you know what I haven't? No. Okay, <laughs> no, I haven't. Sorry, I can't help you, but, right. but I'm going to. But, but I'm going to make a note of it because it's something that, you know, won't be difficult to do. And um, it, it's something that I, yeah, I definitely think I need to do that. So it's, it's a good <laughs> point, Andrew. Thank you. No problems. Thank you, Martin. So we've got some quite a few questions here in the chat. Let's um, get into some of these before we wrap up for today. So um, here's one from Amir, which was just, uh, here we go. Thanks for the question, Amir. Did Martin first pose the hypothesis that mean reversion strategies work better in noisy markets before making the back test or the other way around, making the conclusion at risk of overfitting? Right. So 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 the hypothesis, yeah, it's a good good question. So mm. so the the original my original thinking around noise, I think, was the same as um, as most people that noise just gets in the way of trading strategies, regardless of the type of trading, trading strategy. And not for want of mentioning this person too much, but, <laughs> but, but one of the things that Perry Kaufman talks about in his Trading Systems and Methods book is, is the fact that he, he talked about it from a slightly different angle, okay? And, and what he said was, he said, you know, typically, there are certain stocks that from emerging markets so you know like latin america for example that still exhibit low um low levels of noise because market participation hasn't grown to the same levels in those markets yet as it may be has in you know other parts of, of Asia, Europe and, and and the US. And he made just a very simple comment in the book, which was, you know, if you really want to to trade um, these really, you know, these markets with a lot of liquidity and a lot of market participation, maybe you need to think about moving more to mean reversion strategies. And it was just that. It was one sentence. Mm. And so it was that that got me thinking. So then, you know, I sort of headed to, to, the, to my code and started to do the analysis and did the analysis and then, you know, did some, some back tests to see if that actually held water. And... The results just blew me away. Okay, and they were the results that I showed to you, you know, a, a moment ago, or, or similar to that. Mm. Um, and so the answer to the question is that it was something I I read this with this one sentence that just made me do the research, did the research, 
proved that that was the case and never never in my wildest dreams thought it would have such a big impact for for mean reversion strategies but it does Mm. and so um, it's something now that i i'm using in my in my own sort of trading strategies that concept of asset filtering and time frame filtering based on noise but this is a relatively recent um, a recent thing that i've i've sort of come across in my in my own research yep okay thanks for that answer martin and we got a response from amir great answer i was hoping you'd say that thanks a bunch <laughs> um, here's a good question from Benjamin. Thanks for the question, Benjamin. Let me put this one up on the screen. What's the difference between noise and volatility? It's a good question because noise and volatility actually for you know lots lo lots of sort of time in the market, they are very correlated. But there are times when they're not correlated at all so for example if there's an incredibly strong momentum move in the market obviously the volatility will be high but if that move is very clean in its nature and you don't have that fluctuation in the price so the price is just heading in one direction and it's heading there fast that's that's a high volatility market, but it's a low noise market, okay? Because there isn't all of that short-term fluctuation. So that's the difference. But it's a great question because, you know, for a, for a large proportion of the time, volatility and noise do tend to be correlated and they go hand in hand. So if one increases, the other increases. But then there's those occasions when that's not the case and there's very different behavior from volatility and noise. Yeah, yeah. We've actually got another question here about volatility. Uh, this was the very first question in the chat. So it's from Jack. You win the prize, Jack. Thanks for the question. Uh, how to measure volatility in such a way that it's easy to implement in algorithmic trading? I have tried various methods such as converting ATR to a percentage 0 to 100. Would like to know your thoughts yeah okay so so with with volatility obviously average true range is a very common way of of measuring that and depending on what you're trying to achieve by measuring volatility determines whether you need to calculate it on a relative basis or calculate it on an absolute basis so so let me give you an example if you're trying to look at volatility across many diverse assets and those different assets have very wide ranging prices so you know you're looking at something like dollar yen versus aussie uh, australian dollar us dollar which have got very different values then you have to use a relative measure so you've got to convert that ATR to a percentage in order to compare them like for like. However, you know, we've, we've all probably experimented with things like volatility stop losses. And if you're taking that approach, then obviously you don't want a relative measure. You want an absolute measure because you need to, you know, categorically work out where your stop loss is going to be based on the mm -hmm. volatility of the app absolute value of the asset because if you want to do you know three times the atr then it has to be the absolute value so that sort of determines whether you need the absolute version or the relative version i don't know if that answers the question but that, that's sort of my take on it all right thanks martin um here's a question from aaron let me put this one up on the screen Martin, what do you think of harmonic price patterns? Are they part of the noise or something more? Okay, harmonic price patterns. What do you mean by that, Aaron? Um, I, I assume by that you're talking about the cyclic nature of, of price action and you know the way that it cycles with a particular frequency or, or maybe you took turn that a harmonic. Um, and my my own view is that noise is pretty much random 
okay and it's it's purely based on the random timing of when different multi participants are buying and selling and so that i don't feel has any value in terms of trying to do cyclic or harmonic analysis okay but i think cycle analysis is important when you think of it in terms of that meaningful price action and the meaningful price moves because those longer term price moves i believe do have a cycle they have a natural frequency and if you know what that is and you can measure that that will help you to tune your trade entries and your trade exits so yes i i think that's a really great technique but i don't think it's related to noise Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, a couple more questions here, and we'll uh, we'll start wrapping up. Here's a question from Jeff J. Jeff is a regular. Thanks for the question, Jeff. Martin, do you believe trading a strong currency against a weak currency would be a trading advantage? So, with currencies, obviously, they're always in pairs anyway. So you're always you're always trading one currency against another. Okay, there's no other way of trading a currency to my knowledge so so you're always effectively saying well you know if you're if you're trading let's say dollar yen okay you're always looking for well is dollar stronger than yen and if dollar is stronger than yen then the price is going to go up and if yen is stronger than the dollar then the price is going to go down so so i think you know that that analysis of of the strength of individual currencies yes is absolutely fundamental to currency trading there's no other way of of doing it in my view so yes 100 percent is the answer <laughs> okay excellent here's a question from timo martin do you see a deficit of lagging of signals caused by indicators especially for density and efficiency ratio is there a better approach um so i assume timo's talking here about the second category that i was talking about which was that instantaneous analysis of of noise and i guess just like any other indicator lag is 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 always an issue and because you know so in in this research that i've done here for example i've used a 20 i've used 20 periods for both the efficiency ratio and price density and so both of those could start to experience a change in the actual noise in the most recent bars that would be averaged out by previous bars and so there is always going to be a lag i mean one way you can decrease the lag is by reducing the number of periods that you're looking at but then you start to maybe get too much fluctuation in those indicators for them to be as usable so yeah i, I think timo you know lag with any indicators it is an issue um, but i i think using 20 periods for these two indicators is probably quite a good um a good compromise um and actually you know what just just thinking about this <laughs> thinking through this timo's uh, i know timo by the way and okay. timo will gives me great ideas <laughs> he comes up with questions and and i'm like oh yeah i've just had an idea and, and i've just had <laughs> one right now excellent which, which which was because i predominantly looked at the hourly time frame here by by using 24 periods instead of 20 i'm just wondering now to myself whether that mm. would give some advantages because you'd get those you know based on what you said earlier on um what you asked andrew when you were talking about time of day by using 24 periods would take out that effect of time of day so that's yeah that's given me something to think about yeah no, that's an interesting idea. So thanks, Timo, for the question. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so actually, I wanted to ask you a little bit earlier in the chat, and, and I forgot about it. But um, you know, when, when you're applying these um, these noise techniques, are you only looking at that from an entry point of view, or can you use it for other things like trade management, exits, stop losses? Um, you know, mm. what other ways can you use it? Use noise. Okay, so yeah, it's a it's a good question, and really, my my focus at the moment has been on trade entry okay mm. and using that as a almost a binary decision certainly in terms of the instantaneous measurement of noise to decide am i allowed to open or is my algorithm allowed to open this trade or is it not and that's been my my primary focus however my my next piece of research is going to be around changing that from being a binary decision to one more of position sizing mm. whereby instead of saying you either can't trade or you can trade this particular trade signal it will adjust the position size based on how favorable the noise conditions are to the strategy so let's say we've got a mean reversion strategy we're looking for high noise if we've got high noise we might put a larger position size on whereas if we haven't it, we might curtail that position size and make it much smaller so that's going to be my next sort of research area to see if i can get better um, performance out of a strategy than just using a simple binary decision mm. Well, we might have to get you on again in six months to see how your, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, how your latest research is going. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you've got quite a few ideas from today's chat. So, uh, you know, it'll be interesting yeah. to see how, how that goes. So, um, yeah, we're almost out of time. So I'd just like to start wrapping up. Um, we've had some questions in the chat about how people can uh, discover more from you or get in touch with you. So how, what's the best way for people to do that? <laughs> so probably the best way is um, they, they can come to my website, tradelikeamachine.com, and there's a contact page on there so they can send me a message. Um, but, but also, um, I mentioned earlier on that I, I produce these educational videos for, for DarwinX. And so on the DarwinX YouTube channel, you'll find hundreds of, of videos that I've put together, you know, specifically to help traders develop and to pro progress with their careers. And so people, of course, can go there. And indeed, the, the topics that I've talked about today with you around noise, I'm actually in the middle of a, a, a whole video series mm. on the topic of noise. And so if your viewers think that they benefit from going into this in a lot more detail, then they can. Um, I don't know if if you can arrange for a link to the the first of those videos in, in the noise series. Andrew, would that be you possible? Sure can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'll send you that link and then people can sort of delve into this subject in, in, in a lot more detail. Um, but yeah, they can contact me through my website as well. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, thanks a lot for your time today, Martin. Really appreciated this discussion. It's been very interesting. Um, is there anything else you wanted to mention before we finish up for today? No, I think we're all we're all good. We're all done. We're all good. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks again for joining us and thank you to everyone who came along and uh, we had a lot of excellent questions in the chat. I hope I got to most of them. If I missed any, um, you can uh, contact Martin. I'm sure he'll be happy to to have a discussion with you. And um, don't forget as well to give us a thumbs up on the video and uh, please subscribe so that you get notified anytime we um, you know, release any new content. Um, so uh, thank you, everyone. How about we just have a quick look at some of the feedback in the chat um, because we've got a lot of uh, thank yous here. So one from Timo saying thanks. Uh, here we go. This is Amir saying uh, great research, very promising, uh, cool idea from John. And we've got a lot of others in there as well, which I, uh, I can't keep up with. So thanks again, Martin. Great having you on the show. And I wish you all the best. Thanks, Andrew. It was great to meet you finally. <laughs> All right, cheers. Take care and thank okay. you everyone for joining us. I'll catch you next week. Ciao.